First of all, before we look at the Word of God, I'd like to send birthday greetings to a David Smith in Wales. Not too many here at the present time would remember David. David was with us for about three years or so when we were, around the time when we were building the other auditorium. And also while he was here, he had a, a Bible class of young teenage boys. And there's one of them that's here today, but that, don't take that as a sign that they're not doing well, because most of them that were there at that time are still going on for the Lord. But our elder, uh, Kevin Wilson, was one of those boys in David Smith's uh, Bible class. And uh, I, af after uh, the pandemic, David, uh, of course, he, he went back to Wales after about three years, uh, and then uh, after the pandemic, uh, he started to follow our tapes each week. And so he has done that. And the first uh, time that he wrote, he wrote to Kevin, he sent him an email, and unfortunately, of all the, the men that he remembered, they're all in heaven. <laughs> uh, I'm the only one that was mentioned that he remembered that's not already there. But I look forward to join with those men and uh, today I want to wish David Smith, our friend and brother in the Lord, this is his birthday today, and I send good wishes to him and his family. After uh, about 30 years after the death of Christ and the resurrection and his ascension into heaven, Paul wrote uh, in a letter to the church in Rome, and it's for us in chapter 1 of Romans in verse 16, Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. This was Paul's life message. In spite of the persecution and eventual death, this was the message of Paul. This was the Paul's life message in spite of that persecution. And it was the life message in spite of persecution and death for many through the centuries. And it's still happening today Thankfully not here. The man that we will be reading about today became the first, I believe, the first of many Christian martyrs. If you turn with me then to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And uh, for the sake of time, we'll 
just read a few verses. <clears throat> Verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, Cyr Cyrenians, and Alexandrian, and of them of the Cilia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they paid some men who said that we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council, that is, to the Sanhedrin, and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Warren Wisby, one of the great Christian writers. In his book on this, these chapters of Acts, he entitled the chapter, The Man God Crowned. The Man God Crowned. And then he explains, there are two Greek words used for the English word crown in the New Testament. Diadema, which means a royal crown and gives us the English word diadem. Then there is Stephanus, which gives us the name of Stephen. You can inherit a diadem, but the only way to get a Stephanus is to earn it. Acts 6 and 7 centers on the ministry and the martyrdom of Stephen, a spirit-filled believer who was crowned by the Lord. The Lord himself, you remember, he spoke to the persecuted church in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. He said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Stephen was both faithful in life and death, and remains a great sample a great example for any believer in the Lord Jesus. We are introduced to Stephen as one of the seven men chosen as deacons in the early church. And as servants, they were chosen to ensure that the physical and the material needs of the widows and any church members that were in need were addressed. For ourselves, it's important to understand that we don't need to be chosen or appointed as a deacon to be used of God in serving others. The Apostle Peter writes in his letter, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. We actually see Stephen involved in a kind of a preaching ministry starting at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith or grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And then verse 9 identifies several Jews who had come from Jerusalem, or come to Jerusalem from areas around Egypt and Asia. 
Some of them even had their own synagogue in Jerusalem, and these had witnessed the response of the common people to Stephen's ministry and started to dispute with him. And in verse 9, we are told that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. These deeply religious men were offended and they gained false witnesses to say that Stephen spoke blasphemous words against Moses and God. They took hold of Stephen and brought him before the council of the Sanhedrin. When I read that, I wondered how many of them had been there asking Pilate to crucify the Lord Jesus. I believe that some of them were there, these men of the Sanhedrin. But these religious leaders, they said that we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the teaching of Moses which has been delivered, to, been delivered to us. Verse 15 is so significant. There was something special about this man, Stephen, even in his facial expression. The members of, of the council, as they looked at him, they saw his face as the face of an angel. There was something about the man that could be seen in his appearance, and I believe it goes back to what we we're first told about him, that he was full of grace and of the Holy Spirit. Something of the, the Jewish thinking about their relationship with God, there were at least three things that, that they thought were very important. And these three things were the land, the law, and the temple, and of course the prophets and the patriarchs were involved in the teaching of these things as they related to God. So Stephen, led by the Holy Spirit, starts off with the land. It was God-given. And he begins with the story of Abraham in verse 3 of chapter 7. God revealed his gracious nature by promising the land. And God brought Abraham out of the land of the Chaldeans. And in verse 5, he gave him the promise of the land as a possession. But there was nothing that, Dave, or nothing that Abraham had done who deserved that from God. But we, we are told that he believed God. He believed what God was telling him. And if we stop there for a moment, we can find ourselves in something of a situ situation today. That is that you and I in our sin did not deserve, deserve the least of God's mercy. But God in his great love gave his son for us to bear our sin on the cross of Calvary and then raising him from the dead for our justification. And he asks of us now to secure an eternal relationship and a home in heaven is that we might believe him and trust his son as our savior. That is God revealing his gracious nature to us today. He doesn't promise us a piece of land, but he promises us a home in heaven eternally. Although Abraham never gained the promise in his lifetime, he did inherit the land through the children that God gave him. 
And then, of course, along comes Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. And 11 of them were very jealous of Joseph. And they sold him to slavery down to Egypt. Unfortunately, that sin that they committed caught up with them and they ended up themselves in slavery in Egypt. God then provides a, a man who will lead his people back to the promised land. And God revealed his night righteous nature by giving them his law. And the law was given through Moses, although it was a, a commandment of God, it was a gracious act because it taught the people about God. Because of the perf perfect holiness of God, it taught them that God would dwell with his people. He would be their deliverer and he would guide them when they kept his law and offered pleasing sacrifices to him. Although they promised to keep God's law, they failed time and time again. In verse 42 and 43, Stephen is painting quite a picture of a gracious God revealing himself and delivering them time and time again and a rebellious nature that was nation that was focused on the gifts or the blessings that they received and ignoring and even rejecting the de deliverer and the giver of the blessings God rejecting God himself verses 44 to 50 Stephen tells how God revealed his loving nature by giving them the temple. It had begun as a tabernacle in the desert. The purpose was clear. It was a place where God would dwell among his people. And what a glory it was. It was a gift of God's presence and a demonstration of God's love. But after settling into the land, David and Solomon, they wanted to build a house for the Lord, a temple rather than a tent, where God would dwell among his people. The original intention was good, but it later became a snare. The glory of God was very evident in the tabernacle in the wilderness, but the glory of the temple became the temple itself. It was such a beautiful, magnificent structure that God's glory became secondary to the glory of the temple itself. The result was that the Jews of Stephen's day were clinging to the physical reminders of a dimly remembered relationship to a distant God. The Jews, you remember, when Jesus accosted them, they turned the temple into a place of business, a marketplace. And back in the Old Testament, God had cautioned Solomon. God said, if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, and I will uproot them from my land which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all the people. That's what happened when the gifts or the blessings had replaced the deliverer and the giver of the blessings. And Stephen's indictments of the Jews' rejection of God revealing himself is summed up 
and verse 51. A very, very unusual but true. He said to them, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Then he goes on to tell them that God was revealing himself to them even now. And in verse 52, God revealed himself perfectly in the giving of his Son, is the only one, only one verse, but it is right to the point. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and the murderers. This is where he gets to the heart of their rejection. The prophets had prophesied about the coming Messiah, and when he came, they put him to death, as we were thinking about and being reminded about earlier on. And all these things up to now were a history lesson, but now the, this rejection of God's revelation to his people, Jesus the just one, the righteous one, and they had rejected him. The reality had come, but they were still clinging to the shadow. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed at him with their teeth. There was no repentance, only a rage and a fury there was a stubborn rebellion that would be, soon be seen in an act of violence, but it did not stop Stephen. Verse 55, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing, not sitting, standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen tells them this, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Their rebellious fury takes over and they cried out with a loud voice, closed their ears and ran at him together and they cast him out of the city and stoned him to death as he was calling to God, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit and kneeling down, he cried out, Do not charge them with this sin. Something similar to what the Lord Jesus had said. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And when he, Stephen, had said this, we're told that he fell asleep. It's the first time that I believe that the Holy Spirit uses this expression to describe the passing of a believer. Paul uses sleep several times rather than death. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes, Don't be concerned about those who are asleep, that you sorrow not, as others who have no hope. For the believer, the body of the believer who dies is said to sleep between the time of death and the resurrection. Paul calls it sleep in Jesus. I suppose most people would look at a scene like this martyrdom and they would come to the conclusion that the church of Jesus Christ will never get over this. It's something that they will never get over. But there was a young man there who stood and guarded the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen. 
He stood there in approval of what these men were doing. But the Holy Spirit of God would burn that scene into the heart of that young man called Saul of Tarsus and never allow him to forget it. Little did he know then that God was at work in his life. So Paul would write about the Christian experience. For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And this, beloved, has been the spiritual experience of Christians as they face the criticism and pers persecution from this world. For Stephen and Paul himself, for thousands down through the last 20 centuries, it was a reality. As the day of our Lord's coming draws nigh, may we may face such difficulty, and may the Lord help us to say in all our difficulties, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for our meetings that we have had this morning. We thank you for the reality of the Savior's death and his resurrection has been impressed upon our hearts. And may these things, our Father, go with us each and every day of our lives and honor your name and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>